This is a video about the new Torchlight Brigade bundle by Corvus Belly for Infinity. I feel like absolute big time because I got a copy of the action pack and also the reinforcements pack uh, to unbox and explain. There are more timely unboxings, more timely previews, but not all of them are going to explain what the hell a, a Vidoc is, for example. So uh, this video is a taster and an overview and preview and also a, a contest uh, for the new Torchlight Brigade stuff. So uh, let's get to it. Biro Tiandi, named for Tian Di, Emperor of Heaven. One of the many terms for Tian, creation, heaven in Chinese theology. Tian Di's goal was originally just to study the heavens. It was to provide up-to-date catalogs of stellar and planetary events that might affect the solar system or disrupt travel. They were basically a glorified weather bureau. O12 has been around for a long time. They just lacked the prestige of the Concilium Convention in the years preceding the Nanotech Wars. In the aftermath, though, the exodus from Earth really kicked into gear. Bureau Tiandi became a critical staple of interstellar society. The Bureau now has a number of operations across the sphere. They worked alongside the Hak Islamite Institute of Planetology to bore through the icy moon of Diogenes in the Human Edge system, seeking to find a rare liquid ocean, using ships like the Absolas to monitor progress. Tiandi is funded directly by O12, though much of its money now comes from selling its survey data to governments and corporations. Rumors abound that it will work alongside nations and corporate entities to sell unusual survey data that will require new technologies to be developed to exploit. Then, they'll ask for a stake in those technologies, effectively monetizing the act of inventing new mining developments. The Bureau still monitors space weather, but the group pours the majority of its funding into wormhole exploration. Probes plunge through wormholes. Explorers and pilots seek out systems capable of sustaining life. Legions of scientists work to grasp exotic physics. To this day, they still don't have a better metaphor than pushing a pencil through paper. So Tiandi's been busy. They worked alongside Trimurti to ensure that survey data of planets like Dawn was used for humanitarian purposes first and foremost. Profit would come later. They surveyed small remote planets and moons in Human Edge. They helped Project Inanna create the Defiance. Tiandi investigated combined army traffic and tried to understand the vastness of their empire. And of course, if someone's fuel ran dry, Tiandi was there to rescue them with the civilian patrol craft. Many members of Tiandi joined Starmata, and also, the Bureau also works very closely with Bureau Noir's hidden listening outposts when making surveys. During the events of Ensong, the Tezeki Digester was detonated, and its destruction created new wormholes in the outer reaches of the Concilium system. Tiandi pounced. This was the sort of extremely devastating, unlikely emergency that they trained for. See, for years, Bureau Aegis and Bureau Noir had been working alongside Bureau Tiandi to prepare for the discovery of new, valuable worlds. They had seen how much chaos had erupted on Paradiso and Dawn, and they wanted to make sure it would not be replicated. There would not be another neo-colonial war, not if O12 could stop it. This was the Torchlight Program. Its members were secretly recruited from existing bureaus, trained, and ready to answer the call should a new home for humanity ever appear. Scattered across the human sphere, its agents were told to lie in wait. Torchlight Brigade agents are therefore scattered across human space, and when an armed conflict breaks out, they'll be deployed alongside diplomacy to stop any conflict between major powers and therefore protect civilians. So the time has come. With the digester exploding and creating a bunch of new wormholes, there's, well, there's a bunch of new worlds and people are going to fight over them. I think that Torchlight Brigade is overall pretty cool. The theming is supposed to be like, oh, this is an elite group of guys who have been waiting and, and lying in wait for years and are ready to respond anywhere, anytime. I don't know. It's a Shoto, right? It's a Shoto sectorial. Here's the Silver Star. I don't adore the helmets. Um, they're kind of cool. I think that this thing it feels like that would be hard to wear, you know, like I get my head caught on it. But uh, everything is very WYSIWYG in some ways, as in like Riot Stoppers on there now. Kind of interesting. Uh, or is it the Blitz and I'm not 100%. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, the models themselves, metal still, uh, with the exception of the CO-Cast bits. We've got some of them. For example, the Silver Star Prime bits. Uh, you've probably seen this in other videos. Silver Star Prime uh, got a got got a bit of a bone. What's up with the huge sword when it's like it's not even like great or even okay in CC? There's some very confusing design language, to be honest. However, with that said, I actually quite like the sculpt. I'm very fond of the Silver Star Prime 
Uh, I do always like the double arms thing. I think that's really cool. And to be honest, for me, it might just be a wrecker. The helmets, like I said, cool fringe. Yeah, I mean, they're cool sculpts. What do you want me to say? I love a multi-rifle, love a big chunky guy. It does fit. It does fit, you know, it's gonna fit. Just barely. There are definitely some models that feel like they were just made for like much larger base sizes and they like uh, barely fit. Older players might even remember the old days where like you would have little base extenders. That was kind of funny. Here's the one of the striders. So I'm sure you may have seen this if you've watched any other unbox. And mechanically, it does sort of seem here's the Hellblazer. Like Torchlight's thing is that they are they are that. They are like a generic good sectorial. You know, their thing is like, hey, we are pretty good. Uh, we've got heavy infantry and light infantry. And if you want to do them well, you're not supposed to actually play heavy infantry spam. You're supposed to sort of play with like a well-rounded force, kind of like uh, military orders. So they are a well-rounded generic sectorial where you play with mixed fire teams, not homogenous fire teams. You use all the wild cards, you mix them up. You've got a core and a Harry's, that sort of thing. I mean. I think that's cool. The sword is a total Warcraft sword is one of my main issues. The Hellblazers are like a model that I'm so mixed on because there's something so badass about a big heavy infantry trooper who wants to get in there. They've got like a version of Maximus' shield. That's really cool. Tiny, tiny light shotgun. Wow, that thing is really small. <laughs> uh, this is the guy, I think. Anyway, super badass miniature just mixed on the sword and like the helmet. <sighs> The lack of help, the mask really does just make it look like a space marine. So this is a like, if I, this is like the basic good sectorial, right? Like if you want to play the sectorial, they're good. They're fine. That's their thing is that they're fine. They're, they're a mixed arm sectorial. But here's what makes me sad. People didn't like Starmada when it came out because Starmada is not that. Starmada is not a generic good sectorial. It's one of the nice things about metal models. You can bend them, um, good and bad. Oops. Anyway. Uh, so like Starmada, by comparison, is like a rushdown character. Starmada has all this stuff about getting up in your face. You know, they've got robots and they've got bronze and the Vinyaka fire team and whatnot. Uh, they've got Hector, who's just like wants to get in there and, and beat him down and uh, just a whole, well, basically Starmada came out and I feel like a lot of people didn't get Starmada and complained that it was bad. And they gave Starmada all this stuff that to make it better, but unfortunately, Starmada is much more generic now. Now it's like torchlight, but not as good, I guess. Its theme has really been watered down from like a naval spec ops, like assault breaching force into a generic sectorial. I desperately wish that maybe Corvus Belly, here's all the backpacks by the way, had like uh, put out torchlight first, you know, the mechanical torchlight was first, and then you do Starmada afterwards. You know, you do the basic sectorial first because again O12's thing is hey we are a sectorial aimed at new players um, so you put out the generic good multi multi threat sectorial first and then you do the second sectorial the much more nuanced and specialized one after I don't know like the rest of O12 torchlight units are peacekeepers rather than an invading army they wield advanced weaponry created by section Clio these weapons are designed to render targets unconscious chemical drugs, electrical disruption, concussive blasts, and more. Bureau Tiandi deploys Torchlight Brigade to hotspots across the sphere to neutralize threats between powers just when they're getting started. Light to the darkness and all that, yada yada. Okay, let's go over some units. Psycops, members of the Psy Unit, which is the military intelligence agency for Bureau Aegis, and therefore all of O12. Their job is to be everywhere and gather intel, making them well-rounded and flexible troopers, beast hunters, and diggers. Makes sense for a group that's going to be fighting on the frontier. Well, oh, here's the Nimrod, by the way. Let's talk Nimrod. Let's talk Nimrod. Nimrods, son of Cush, therefore the great-grandson of Noah. Nimrod was described as a king in the land of Shinar in Lower Mesopotamia. The Bible says that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord and began to be mighty in the earth. Although the Bible never states this, uh, Nimrod in the Jewish and Christian traditions built the Tower of Babel and fought Abraham. I leave the research to you. I do not know much about Nimrod or the Nimrod unit. Oh, the Nimrod looks really cool in my opinion, but I'm a simp for somebody with a cool coat and like a badass faceless helmet. Oh my God, I'm gonna be using this guy all the time. <laughs> I'm, it's the classic like, I'm gonna use this guy regardless of how good he is, just because I think he looks like a total badass and I'm excited to use him. 
I like that he's got the, the, the hand. I wonder if he's supposed to be a lefty or if he's just holding the gun in his hand, in his left hand while he's communicating. I don't know. The theme is, is the lore is cool, just that the mechanical theme does not excite me as much, you know? If I wanted to play a generically good sectorial, I could do that. Um, anyway, I, I might have done something like, oh, what if all these guys were tack aware, but you could only take like 10 units total because they're supposed to be like a rapid response force that's all unique. What if every single one of them had NCO or number two? You know, that could be something. What if they were all veterans, kind of like the Morats or, or Drews Bay Rams? Well, not Drews, but you know, pure Drews. What if, uh, what if these guys, here's another thought, you had to take two five-man cores or something, and that was it, one combat group. Um, one idea I was thinking, what if they had impersonators? In the very, very, by the way, we're now looking at the reinforcement pack. In the very, very early days, of Infinity, there was something really interesting about O12. It's like a one or two pages in the first or second edition of Rulebook, where it describes O12, and it kind of describes them as scary. Not like a, ooh, they're actually evil scary, but in the sense of like, governments are afraid of them, because anybody could secretly be working for O12. I think that's kind of the RPG roots, like, anybody could secretly be a, you know, a player character in this anti, in like an anti-terrorism, anti-corruption task force. You know, that sort of thing. But like, Oh, that's such an interesting idea. You know, people are like, hey, O12 could have sleeper agents, people who have spent years of their lives just doing their thing, and now they're being called up to come, like, you know, defend the human sphere. Here's one of the jack boots, by the way. He's got the Spitfire. Spitfire design has changed over the years, even for O12. I, um, I'm neutral on it. I think it looks cool. It's fine. I don't adore that he's got this. Uh, second gun in his hand, but like it looks it's gonna look cool, you know, one gun up, one gun down. Ah, the jackboots. The members of the Armed Presence Unit are veterans who have been hardened in the streets, in riots, in raids, in any number of the low-intensity conflicts that Bureau Aegis is constantly involved in. Nicknamed Jackboots, this unit is generally assigned to the nasty and dangerous work on the ground. They spend long periods, sometimes months away from home, on missions that are not pleasant and are always very complex. Not there. It could be a nomad mining colony on Human Edge. It could be shutting down conflicts on Paradiso in the aftermath of a skirmish or a border conflict, or a book. It could be farther away, on the far side of one of the new wormholes, where tensions between explorers, settlers, and national interests all collide. Well, why do they do it? Because they like it. They love it. For them, the action is the juice. They genuinely consider O12's governing ideals of cooperation, unity, support, and progress to be worth upholding. They've all completed at least one tour of duty and could probably shift to a desk job or supervisory role, but like, why bother? Instead, the Armed Presence Unit elects for advanced, non-intrusive biotechnological enhancements and they continue to fight. Some of them do it because they want to help people, others like violence, some of them like their co-workers or really have pride in their unit. Regardless of their reason, they consider themselves to be invaluable members of Sword 4. If you need an iron boot to crush the dragon's skull and free the innocent from evil, Jack Boots do it. Other units, wave riders, no idea. Cludgers, no idea. It means jury rigging, I guess. Silver stars, hell blazers, yellow jackets, striders, wreckers, no idea on them. Their lore will come eventually. Subscribe, and I'll get back to you in five to six months. This profile is just Samus Aran from Metroid. Did you know that Metroid Dread was made by Mercury Steam, which is a company based out of Madrid in Spain? Nintendo don't uh, like Star Fox or Metroid very much. This is two Spanish made versions of Samus Aran. Clock's ticking, Nintendo. Here is one of the Vidox. Vidox, let's talk Vidox. The Vidox Multipurpose Security Brigade are named after Eugene Francois Vidoc. Vidoc was quite a character. Born in 1775, he was a criminal artist who eventually became a forensic scientist. Uh, um, he was a man so fascinating that uh, Victor Hugo, uh, Balzac, and uh, Edgar Allan Poe were all inspired to write about characters uh, like him. In fact, you may know the murders in the Rue Morgue, with C. Auguste Dupont, that's the first story about a fictional detective. Well, that guy is heavily based on this dude, uh, Vidoc. Vidoc uh, started off uh, in Napoleon's army, but uh, after years of becoming a fraudster and, um, you know, then a forger and then a smuggler, he decided to change his life around and became an informant, and from there he became a spy, then a spy master, a criminologist, a private detective, uh, the first private detective, by the way, and the founder of the first private detective agency. The Vidoc unit is named in honor of this legendary figure. Sexton Spatha, also known as Sword 4, 
has a small but elite special operations department which dispatches those Gladius team task forces. Sword 4 would love to always deploy a bunch of ultra-elite and highly trained secret agents, but such personnel are simply not available. That's where the Vidop unit comes in. The unit's goal was to find multi-purpose flexible troops from outside the usual recruitment centers. They were to look not just in the ranks of Bureau Aegis, but to look at the war market for mercenaries. Recruiters combed through Section Satera's lists of criminals with skills. They went to civilians behind desks who had aptitude for field work. They went to bars to find shady fixers and prisons to find recalcitrant criminals. O12 can't love for the same level of pay that criminals in Submondo um, can do, you know, but they can offer things that you can't buy with money. Peace of mind, freedom from prison, witness protection programs for friends and family, debt erasure, maybe even resurrection. The Vidalp unit hires people for the long term, not short contracts. The benefits are always intangible rather than fiscal, and despite skepticism from some, the Vidalp unit's members tend to be unerringly loyal to the cause of O12. Their vibe is casual and carefree. They're brash, uh, a little rough, and like the same decorum that many O12 agents have. They bristle against Epsilon unit analysts, sometimes competing over the same data. After all, Vidoc units, much like uh, Eugenie Francois Vidoc, often spent years of their lives as criminals. But even if they're not always respected, they are extremely confident in their skills, loyal to their organization, and they're very motivated. After all, they were the ones recruited to be special agents, <laughs> not their foes. They're the hunters. They're no longer the hunted. So, the Vidoc is a lady on a big platform. I'm surprised that this platform here is not CO-cast, to be honest, because it's big and heavy, and I bet it was expensive to produce. I would have made a CO-cast, but I don't care. I don't know. It's fine. It's neat. It's gonna add a lot of weight. Uh, the pose, Jackboot. Again, he's got, like, the Riot Stopper, which makes the SMG so damn big. Also, still cool. Also, the Gizmo Kit. Uh, in N4, they started sculpting gizmo kits. Isn't that interesting? They didn't always have them. I have no strong opinion on that. I think it's fine if you don't sculpt the gizmo kit, personally. Another Vidalk and another Jackboot. Kind of a boring, basic pose, but, like, it's okay. It's okay, because the other one's very, very exciting. The Marksman Rifle 1 is hype. This lady has a shotgun, and she is aiming down the sights with it. Uh, and there is no uh, optic on it, because, presumably, uh, you know, she's got it in her glasses. It's like a smart link thing. Neat! Cool! It's fun! Got a pistol and a, a medikit. Neat, cool, that's fun. Peacekeeper, you know, all, all 12 guys technically have like non-lethal weapons. I think that they could have just said, oh, you know, we don't have to sculpt everything on the gun because it's so sci-fi, but like, whatever, I think it's cool. I also, uh, random thought, I feel like there's a lot of AP in Infinity and 4 uh, and uh, SMGs, I'm sorry, a lot of AP and a lot of shock. And SMGs having both is like, it's dangerous because so many goddamn things um yeah i don't know that's a lot that's a bigger discussion this is it this is the lady this is the mint agent this is the real sculpt they previewed another one that was not used and is probably not coming out and this one is also freaking sick i don't i didn't you know for some reason i didn't even realize that she was on the craggy rock huh well, all my O12 stuff is sort of on urban basis, so that's a little complicated, but I still like it. The Mint Agent. Oh my goodness. Professional Standards Investigation Department. This is Bureau Aegis's anti-corruption team. Bureau Trimurti's task is internal affairs, and their elite agents focus on corruption, misconduct, and proper professional standards. I basically did a video all about them. How fun is that? Bureau Aegis has its own internal operations and anti-corruption investigators. Bureau Trimurti does have final say, but they're sometimes seen as interlopers. Trimurti teams very rarely have to pick up a gun and rescue someone from a rogue unit. PSID is the Professional Standards and Investigation Department, and that unwieldy name was intentionally chosen by Bureau Aegis to avoid having to say internal affairs, and also to avoid stepping on the toes of Bureau Trimurti. PSID oversees standards across Bureau Aegis. O12's remit and military force means that if someone were to dispatch a Gladius team for unethical reasons, it would be absolutely disastrous. Say a commander has two cases they could pursue. One of them might be investigating a smuggling operation, the other might be eliminating an illegal operation by the Druze mafioso. Both of them would prove beneficial to the human sphere as a whole, but if they chose to ignore the smugglers, they might get a cushy paycheck and a fat job for their family. 
Mint agents are there to determine whether or not such behavior or and such decisions are made for tactical reasons or for personal gain. Mint is from the Russian uh, Mint. Uh, it's a slang word for police. It was frequently used to describe Bilitsaya, the Soviet police force. The term may have come from the Polish word Minda, meaning crab lice. PSID agents work undercover in units they suspect of unethical behavior. When they're not in disguise, they wear these long cloaks that look pretty damn cool. They are technically not police, but they police the police. Mint are disliked by most agents in Bureau Aegis because they're seen as aloof, elitist, and could give an integrity test at any time. O12 is extremely diligent about corruption. For civilian agencies, this is generally done with a softer hand. With a militarized police force, Mint agents are used instead. Mint agents really hate dirty cops. Absolutely hate them. They are really good at finding dirty cops, too. Mint agents are not just investigators, they are experienced criminologists. They know how to spot impersonators and fakers and holographic decoys without technology. Mint agents know how to move around quietly, and they're often deployed as detectives to support investigations and make sure that they are not in the way. They can also work their normal anti-corruption jobs uh, alongside O-12 combat deployments, making sure that nobody makes any mistakes or ethical lapses, even in the heat of battle. Mint agents are true cold professionals. They realize that a clean bureau aegis means a safer human sphere, and that the safety of ordinary people is worth more than the life of a dirty cop. She's reaching out for her stun stick while she's got the, uh, the assault pistol. I think it is a badass. If I were to play a role-playing game with like a sci-fi aesthetic uh, that used miniatures, uh, I play RPGs with sci-fi aesthetics and I play miniatures games. I generally don't mix the two. Yeah, I would use her. She is so damn cool. You show me somebody with a, pol is it a polutka? Uh, you show me a lady with a side cap, I'm losing my mind. So cool. Uh, my shame is, way back in the day, I must have spent 50 bucks on loot boxes trying to get the Tracer in Overwatch uh, skin. Last thing to unbox. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm actually not going to give this one away uh, in the George Lake bundle because I was planning on uh, uh, having that be a prize for a tournament. Um, so this one's just for me, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Slim Shady. Uh, this pose is real, like, it's really charmingly silly. I, I like it a lot. But I believe in the, uh, it, the joke is this is supposed to be Max Scorpio, with Max Scorpio uh, being one of the old Bounty Hunter models. I believe he was a, a promo or something. Anyway, I think he's a total badass. Uh, I really like this sculpt because he's got this, like, gas mask on. Uh, he's got, like, a hat. He does look like a, a low-life Bounty Hunter, not like a super stylish one. It's nice that they gave him a Spitfire. Um, he's, like, he's, got the, he's got a cool-looking pistol. Uh, I don't recognize what pistol that is. I think it's not the Pan-01. It might be the Nomad pistol. Probably, I don't remember off the top of my head which pistol that is. Anyway, he's got a, a Pan-Oceanian Baggio or Bago um, Spitfire. Cool. Point is, uh, he's cool, uh, and he's in a pre-order if you get it. And uh, those are all the miniatures in it. This is the end of the video. So if you are interested in entering to try and get some of this stuff, all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash warlord. There's links in the description if you can't type it out. And follow me. I repeat, follow me. Uh, you do not have to be a paying member. You just have to be a, a member. Uh, you just click the button and then you, you don't click anything to pay. So yes, it is totally free. It is, it is just the, the act of signing up uh, to follow me. And it is self-serving because then it means I've got more quote-unquote subscribers, but also it means I can contact you without having to deal with YouTube's comment system. Anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, if you like this video, let me know what you think. Uh, I've got more stuff to do. And if you're at Adepticon 2024, maybe I'll see you there. Thanks.